can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. And Mark Patchett of Growth.shop. And before I formally introduce you, Mark, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And since uh, Mark is a thriving, growing agency, some of the other ones I've had on, uh, David Hernandez, Lotus823, talks about influencer marketing and their strategy to get brands in front of ideal customers. So this relates to this episode as well. And Robert Dodd and Joe Solano, uh, they're co-founders of XL Technologies. Uh, they've been doing the digital agency thing for over 20 years. What's cool about them, and they they specialize in real estate brokers uh, and help sk- people scale their, their brokerages, but they grew a uh, and built up a SaaS company within their agency, which is kind of interesting to hear how they did it. And then, of course, uh, Jason Swank. I had two episodes with him, how he built up his eight-figure agency and sold it, and then what they're looking for in acquiring agencies these days. And that's actually how Mark and I met. So shout out to Jason. Thank you. Um, And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for you to launch and run your podcast. We do accountability, the strategy, and all the execution around it. You know, for me, Mark, we know each other a little bit. Uh, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. I'm, I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and profile them. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Mark Patchett. He's founder of Growth.shop. And he's been in the D2C trenches for over a decade building brands like Victoria Beckham Beauty, Nectar Sleep. They grew from 10 million to 240 million in 18 months, plus hundreds and hundreds of other brands. And we're going to, he's going to break down how his thought process, what they've done. And, uh, you know, Growth Shop was built to provide brands with, with the have product market fit, access to the firepower of a team that can help grow it even more. So, uh, they're currently based in Dubai after departing from their home in the Ukraine, uh, and the team is headquarters in London. And Mark, thanks for joining me. Good to be here, man. Absolute pleasure. So just talk for a second about Growth Shop and, and what you do. Growth Shop, Growth Shop, Growth Shop. So uh, we do we do a bunch of stuff. You summarized it really well. The the main bit is partnering with consumer brands that are, that are doing about two to five million a year that have really really good product market fit. And we we normally see strong founder led companies that have had exposure to a potent, like a particular kind of market, and they're like shit. I just know there's a better way at doing this. They've gone away and they've created the product. They understand the product development. They understand the customers. And that's usually enough to get a business to the two to five million level. Like even if you've got basic kind of Facebook ads, you can get there. Uh, getting from five to 10 and then up to the couple hundred million level, it requires a bit of a different uh, skill set and really, really deep, really understanding the whole growth ecosystem. Uh, so we built those big brands like at Nectar Sleep hitting 240 million. And then you know, we left there at the 333 kind of level. Uh, and then we took that that team we built, fully integrated growth team. And then we partner with those brands uh, and run a couple in parallel. So talk about, so a brand comes to you. Um, I'm curious of what they are doing currently. Are they doing some version of paid advertising? And then what uh, the services that you're you're working with them on they they're always doing paid marketing like that's that's our jet fuel that's how we build these brands really really quickly they're usually doing an o, an okay job sometimes they've got like a mid-level person managing it inside most of the time they've got an agency and largely what we see like we do a whole audit of these companies and it's it's a similar type of audit you'd use if you're trying to understand the valuation of a company uh, which is always a nice way to look at it. It's not just talking about Facebook ads, but ultimately talking about exit valuations. And the, the numbers are just kind of flat. 
And the numbers are flat because like a typical agency is just looking within the Facebook platform, they're recycling some ads and they're just kind of coasting. And it's like a safe zone. So to, to push and to really go quickly, you've got to get quite aggressive. So we we cover all the media buying piece, but then we have a fully integrated creative solution. So we, we extract UGC. Usually they do their own shoots. We help them guide it. Then we have a whole data platform in the back end that sucks all of that data and gives a one unified view, which is dollar in, dollar out. Like we don't care what Facebook says. We don't care what Google says. We care how much money you're getting and how much money you're spending. So we plug that in. And then the layer within that as well is all CRM. So it's uh, kind of really powerful email automation, SMS automation, referral, all those types of bits. Mark, you looked under the hood of a lot of different brands and companies. I'm curious, when you take them through the audit, what are some of the most common or biggest mistakes that you see the companies making? Yeah, good question. There's always quite a few. So a lot a lot of the time it's been not understanding what attribution looks like across different platforms. So someone often will say, we don't think Facebook's working. You know, we want to be making $3 for every dollar we're spending, but we're only making uh, $2. But then you realize that Facebook used to do a good job at capturing all this, but a lot of this time now it's missing it. So when you look at the blended metrics of the company, maybe they're at $4 for every dollar. So we help them understand that Facebook might be doing more than they think. So we actually accelerate, well, we'd help them model it out. And we'd say, look, let's test. What happens if we increase the budget by 50%? You're still looking at that number, which you don't think is necessarily good enough, but let's look at how much money you're actually making. So that's that's a major thing. Then there's always just like housekeeping bits, like people neglecting the importance of conversion rate optimization uh, and things like keeping really powerful, fresh reviews top of mind. So lots of those types of housekeeping bits, but a lot of it comes down to understanding attribution problems. Talk a little bit more about that, um, neglecting conversion rate optimization. Obviously, you're driving traffic to websites and pages, and that's a big component. I mean, you could do your job and drive lots of people there and then they're not converting. So what how what have you seen when they neglect conversion rate? What are they, the mistakes they're making there? A lot of the time you can find out from just asking what their site refresh uh, rate has been, what their CRO testing roadmap looks like. And the the really powerful thing that we help people understand is that we're like, all right, you want to W business? I'm like, well, how would you go about and do that? How how would you go about doing that? And they're like, oh, we we you know increase the budgets. I'm like, well, what if I told you you could double your business without spending another cent? Like, all right, tell me more, tell me more. And what what's cool about it is that you only need to increase like three of the four main growth levers by 26 percent each to double a business. So if you increase the conversion rate by 26 percent you increase the average order value by 26% and you increase the repeat rate or lifetime value by 26%. None of those need more money. None of those need more traffic and you can double your business. So we like to execute on those different areas uh, and then increase budget in parallel. But the, the types of things that are really common that people are neglecting with CRO is assuming that people understand their brand as well as they do. So we like to use uh, like a sense check called the reverse elevator pitch, which is that before someone even scrolls below the folds, say they're landing on the homepage, in about five seconds or so, someone should be able to tell you exactly what you do uniquely. That's it, as quick as that. And most most sites don't pass this test. Don't say, they're like, well, we say all that shit, like, you know, down below, just check it out. It's in the Our Story page. I'm like, 80% of people aren't going to scroll below, scroll below the fold, 80%. So you got to nail it there. So there's a lot, of, a lot of kind of easy things that are very powerful like that. Mark, I think, I don't know, from my research, it shows I don't think you've written a book, but I think you should. How would you double your business without spending more money? And you go three things. Well, there's four things, but three things without spending more money. And then the fourth is obviously the firepower, right? Increasing the, the budget there. Um, you know, you mentioned the reviews. And... I've seen a cool, you present a cool chart, which basically one of the things you do with your clients, I think, is you take all of the competitors' reviews um, and you run them through, uh, I'm not sure exactly how you, your magic works, but but you run them through and you you actually see, you help the that company find out their unique positioning in the market under different categories, right? 
Yeah, it's, it's so powerful. So powerful. And it's it's part of our like onboarding research piece. We love to do it. And it's it's like the easiest hack as a marketer. So you could have the you could go away for like a week brainstorm session that costs fifty thousand dollars. It's like, who are we? Who are we as a brand? But it's like the people that I'll find who you are as a brand are your customers. Like you can guide them. So the, the process starts with review exports and review scraping. So what all people need to do is export all of your reviews, find two to three competitors, and usually do it on like the primary product, and then get those reviews scraped. So you can get someone on Upwork to do this for 80 bucks. And then what you do in the most basic form is to do things like run word cloud analysis. So it just extracts the most common themes. And what we're looking for is positive reviews and then negative reviews. And what you're trying to get as an outcome is, you know how you talk about your brand and how you think about your brand. What are your customers actually talking about? What's really resonating with them? And there's often things that really, really stand out that you're not even talking about. So then what you want to do is you want to do the same thing with your competitors to then find out where are we really strong? What are customers loving about us and then hating about our competitors? And what are our competitors doing really well that we might not be doing such a good job at? And uh, it, it really works well. So like at Nectar, we ran we ran the same thing. And we found out that everyone, all, all people talked about was comfort, but people talked about comfort for all of our competitors. We had a 365 night trial versus they had 100. People just obsessed over that. We're doing an okay job at that. But then people really liked our logistic experience versus they didn't like it for our competitors. So straight away, we know that people are going to look at three brands. So we start trying to find these like trigger points, like kind of twisting, twisting the blade a little bit uh, on the competitors. And it, it works phenomenally. Yeah, I love it. I think I saw with Nectar specifically, some of the competitors were spending... I don't, I don't know, you know, but lots and lots of money on their ads and their creative and everything. And you talked about how you spent $300 and made, help them uh, drive that into 10 million. Yeah, it was like a beautiful shitty ad. It's like, yeah, Casper had raised 380 million. Purple were killing it with their YouTube ads. Uh, and it was, it's kind of like how ugly websites work sometimes. Because, you know, there's there's a lot of hypothesis, hypotheses around it. And sometimes it communicates value. Like if you go into like a basic hotel, you know, it's a basic hotel. Uh, but this ad, we were kind of one of the first people to use like user-generated content. So instead of having these big budget productions, we're like, we don't have the money to do that. So what else can we do? Well, we can do this. Uh, and then the concept around that ad all came from that review scraping process. So instead of doing these big, expensive uh, kind of consulting activities, we were just like, oh, let's find out what people actually give a shit about. Then let's get real people talking about it. The end. So works well. talk about how the audit process works. So when a, a company, if they first want to engage with you, you would um, charge them for an audit, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. So how does, the, right. how does the audit process work? So the audit process has a few different bits and it depends on the size of the company and the amount of data we've got. So like in the most basic form, it's it's plugging into their, their e-commerce platform. So something like Shopify and extracting out net sales and looking at things like refund rates. Then it's taking all of the data from the marketing platforms that they're using, whether it's Google Ads, TikTok, Meta. Then we mush it all together to run a historical analysis to see how that business has been going month over month for the last two years or so whatever period is relevant. And then we use forms of marketing mix, marketing mix modeling to try and understand patterns. So often we'll find out it's like, hey, this channel was actually doing way more for you guys. You should have been doubling down or this channel flatlined. And then we'll analyze the creative. We'll look at the amount of time people spend looking at the creative. We'll look at the percentage of people that will stop in the feeds. So we kind of start with this holistic view, uh, like you'd see in a PL for the company overall. Uh, and then we drill down to try and find some easy opportunities what brands mark right now are you paying attention to that when you see you think we should de they should definitely be working with you uh it's so it's it's any of the guys in like the, the beauty space or any any type of brand that has an ltv component because what we're what we're going to find this year is that paid media is going to start getting really hard uh, the brands that are going to do well are the ones that 
can obsess over extracting more from their existing customer list by just new product development or improvements in CRM. So any any brands that have a natural type of LTV component to them. So do any stick out to you that you're you're following? Uh, yeah, there's a lot we're looking at in the beauty space. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. There's quite a few. Um, I want. How did you get into this? I got into this, I got a library book when I was 15 or so, which was building websites for dummies. Uh, and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to tinker around with this. Uh, and then I built built a website using Dreamweaver, which was just like a painstaking process. Like you think you're getting it right and then you launch it and then something's broken, you go back and forward. Uh, but then I finished the site. I'm like, great. I'm just going to grab the cat. Uh, and I was like, all right, now I've got this website. I'm like, how the hell do I get people to the website? So I Googled how to get people to website. I'm like, all right, SEO. All right, I'm going to learn how to write some articles and get some backlinks. Then I started getting some people to the site. And I'm like, all right, how do, now i got these people. How the hell do I make money from this thing? How to make money online? And then got uh, stuck into the affiliate world. And then I'm like, all right, I've got these people. I'm making some money. How do I get them to spend more money? like option rate optimization so kind of just went in this journey and then would launch new brands work out what i didn't know work for a company with with people top of their game kind of learn some more add some value there and then the cycle goes on and on and on oh mark just three things i want to ask about which i know you you think deeply about and the first is positioning um markets crowded um you know you mentioned with nectar i mean there's there is competitors in every industry, right? So how do you think about um, positioning? It's a tricky beast. It's a tricky beast. We have, we have the advantage that we've done it before and built companies, uh, which if you've only, like most, most kind of performance agencies may just do like Facebook. They, they may do some ad creative because they kind of need it. But then, and you can think it's the be all and end all. Like I remember when I did that, I'm like, yeah, I know my shit. I'm the king of Google, blah, blah, blah. And then you go and work inside one of these companies or launch your own. And it's just a fraction of it. It's like the reality of, of building these brands and making them successful is negotiating 30 day, 45 day net payment terms with suppliers, or it's negotiating that they can get a piece of equity in exchange for a massive reduction in COGS. So there's all, all these types of parts that are the, the true kind of defining factors of the really successful consumer brands. So the, the positioning that, that we like to bring is that we have in-depth knowledge of that side of the business. So we take that and we, we have like executive level discussions, not just talking about Facebook. It's, it's like overall strategy, whether it's global expansion, like those types of things. Uh, and then we still have our toolkit below, but it's all based off a strategy that comes from understanding how to build really, really big brands overall. You mentioned some growth levers with CRO, the order value, repeat value, um, and the last to put fuel is a lead generation piece. So I love for you to talk a little bit more about uh, lead generation and putting that firepower on. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of it, it kind of unlocks. It's almost like a like a, a role player game where you have to go through certain doors to unlock certain things. So for example, if you don't, if you don't pass the, the reverse elevator pitch, it's really hard to scale paid media because if you haven't got that, it means you don't have the right piece of creative. And if you don't have the right pieces of creative, it's really, really hard to scale kind of paid media. So the, the, the kind of reality of where it's at now is that like 80% of success on platforms like meta is coming from the creative. And even now, with the way that Google is going, a lot of it's kind of mushing in uh, rich media creative with the kind of standard text ads that you've got. So you've got to get really, really good at that. So adding the gas uh, actually comes from all getting all of that other stuff sorted first. And then, then the other kind of 20% is the technical media buying bit. You know, when you're evaluating the companies and seeing where should we put more, more effort and time, you're looking at a lot of the data. And you mentioned briefly earlier about um, a data platform. So how does that work with the, with the brands that you help? So with, with the brands that we help, we have a, a platform that we built, which extracts 
all of the data and then puts it into one uh, unified view, which some brands uh, get close with this. Like maybe they're using a tool like Triple Well or, or Hyros doesn't really complete the picture there. Or they're doing it and built it in Tableau or Looker. It's hard to build this stuff and it's expensive. So we, we've solved that first problem by building all those integrations and then unifying it to give you uh, kind of like an executive level view at any time. How's my business performing today? How was it last week? Yada, yada, yada. But the bit where it gets more powerful is, is looking at things like cumulative analysis. So like any business is going to have different pieces that contribute to an overall goal. So what we do is we have cumulative pacing, which looks at exactly how you're pacing versus your goal versus last year versus this month. And then it breaks it down with the same view over email, over meta. So the idea is that you should be able to land on one page and you should just scroll down a tiny bit and you could pinpoint, even if you didn't understand the technical things and you can understand exactly why a business is performing well or not and where to focus energy next. And then is that something that you share in a report or do they see like a dashboard? What's the, what's it look like? visually when yeah, they, you share get, it. they they get access straight into the mothership which is which is another like accountability thing so instead of just sending like a, a monthly report which is like well facebook says everything's really good and they're like yeah but the business is looking like a piece of shit in the pnl uh we we don't hide behind anything like that so we give them all, all direct access nice um i want to talk uh give a little bit more detail on what you do. And we, we mentioned Nectar before. So can you just talk a little bit about uh, just some of the steps when you first started working with them till, um, you know, just, I guess, scaling up? It was, it was a really good bunch. So I initially started, I'd quit uh, a marketing director role at a company called Truva, which we scaled uh, to be kind of top five fastest growing in Europe. Really, really smart guys. And then uh, met a guy called Scott McLeod, who's a genius. We call him Scotty Boy Genius. Uh, and he he was he was like the linchpin at Nectar. And then there's the three other founders. So initially, I was just helping out with with some meta bits, uh, and then kind of saw the potential. I was like, man, I, I want to do some more with these guys. And what what was cool about that structure is that Casper had like a floor in you know New York City high rises, purple, massive office. Nectar, they were like. All right, let's let's just build out this team wherever we want, anywhere in the world. And I'd been living in Asia and a bunch of other countries and loved finding the best talent anywhere in the world. So they kind of essentially said, you guys do whatever you want. Just grow this business, hire the right people. Let's be smart about it. Just go. So zero red tape. And we were all really growthy guys. We weren't like ex-management consultants. We just loved to tinker and tinker and tinker. So things like that, that ad that did 10 million, you know, they're the things that get turned around in a couple of days. No, no long meetings, no management meetings, just little Slack updates. And we just kind of hacked our way to it. And we just unlocked a little bit of a conversion rate improvement, you know, not really an LTV bit, uh, better ads, increased budget, and kind of just tinker and tinker and tinker. And you forget what the numbers are like. And then you log in and you get a reality check. And you're like, wow, we're spending like 10 million bucks a month. This is like a big thing. This is a big thing. Uh, so yeah, tinkering and freedom and just putting smart people in one uh, virtual place and letting them do their job. What, um, Mark, when you look back on that, um, what learnings did you have, you know, maybe where you, you felt there were these key points where you unlocked something? What would be an example of uh, a time when you're like, we unlocked this, now we're kind of on the next level? I think a lot of it came down from really understanding your numbers. That that was a huge bit. So it was the, it was the time when Facebook attribution was still good. So instead of obsessing over it, uh, we built out like an automated way of doing it. And like we did this in Google Sheets, you know what I mean? Like basic shit, but it was all live and all updated that would extract real revenue, total media spend across everything. And our perspective was, if the business is looking good here, keep hammering it, keep spending, be aggressive and just use the metrics within the platforms as kind of guiding principles. But we never obsessed over it too much as long as the business was working. So I think we a big learning there was don't obsess over minutia. If you've got smart people that are executing on the right things and they've got freedom and then the overall numbers of the company are looking good, just keep hitting it. 
just keep hitting it. You also um, worked with Idol Brands. Talk about what you did with them. That was another mattress one, uh, which was really interesting. And like the, the catalyst that really grew that one was a partnership with the United States Postal Service, which is an absolute beast. And the cool thing about the partnership they had, which is like, a, I always say, God bless America, because they have these programs that not every country has. Uh, and then they, they allow you to extract like 16,000 leads a day. And the data point is that like 60% of people when they move buy a new mattress like 60%. And we know that all of these people are moving. So it, and it was a lead source that didn't require Facebook. It didn't require Google ads. It didn't require anything like, like those channels are working for us. But this thing was like a nitrous jet stream injected into the business. And it went from doing like a hundred thousand dollars a month to 5.4 million a month in like nine months. Absolute beast. I would think that would break a business and it did yes <laughs> and it did and it was like the big the big learning there is that you can you can look at all the growth numbers and it can be fantastic but i've always had this over christmas time where we're hitting these unbelievable numbers and then on the other way we're the happiest people ever and then you look at the poor customer service people and the poor operations people they're like they just see a tsunami <laughs> coming at them they're like man no, stop we're like, we can't, we need our graph to look good. <laughs> right. How do you prepare yeah. now companies for that um, trajectory, right? That maybe they're not used to that fast growth. What do you do? I don't know, maybe to warn the operations or customer support. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a lot we've done on the automation front uh, with customer support. So there's, there's really cool like AI tools that you can, you can plug in. And even with like, uh, the open, uh, so the, the new chat platforms that are coming out, they're insane. They're insane. They can help automate a lot of that. But like the most pain you're going to get is if you're just not shipping things in time because you can't keep up. Like the majority of customer service issues go away if your product is good and it gets shipped on time. So the, the big thing with operations was that this was the time of like the China's anti-dumping laws. That's what really hurt. So having domestic production as like an overflow, even if you're going to lose margin, but it means that you can ship things on time is, is really, really handy. And then a lot of it comes down to the payment terms that you've got with your suppliers. So if you really want to be growing that quickly, you're going to see a lot of money coming in, but you're going to see even more money coming out if you've got to pay 60, 90 days up front. How would you tell them to prep for production? Because, you know, I'm not sure... For in a, in the case of you know, there's a lot of different types of cycles. Whether it's a mattress or a beauty product, you know, if it takes a certain amount of time to actually make the product, do you? It, it's hard. The inventory management seems like, like you said, a kind of a cash flow slash preparing for growth. How do you? How do you tell them we want X number of months on hand for this this campaign when they're not, maybe not used to that? I think it depends on how sure you are of your growth rate. So like another, another common problem we see is that people like the founders have such a steadfast belief in how big their business can be that they'll often allocate, say they raise a bit of money, they'll allocate 80% of that to doing like a bulk inventory deal uh, in exchange for getting you know, a 20% reduction in margin. What, what can be a better approach is appreciating that maybe we won't hit those numbers yet. We will later. So it can often be better having lower margin in exchange for lower orders until you really, really validate that you can get it. Uh, and then in terms of like inventory pacing, that can be really tricky as well. I'd, I'd want to be sure, I have a very, very high degree of confidence that I can hit the numbers I'm going to hit uh, based on historical data, not based on my gut feel. Even if it means you grow a little bit slower, you're going to have a much more stable business and then you can ultimately be bigger and more stable. Yeah, because there's a lot of moving pieces with the supply chain. And we saw even during COVID, a lot of these break down, right? Supply chain, some of them shut down. So yeah. how did you yeah. manage that during, and, and you know, whether it's COVID or something else, 
how did you how did your you see your your clients manage that the ones with with us production were were largely okay it was the ones that had things coming from china that got hammered and with with ones like that the answer is how was it managed just not that well like brands just got cleaned out like that's a, that's a really hard one to plan for but the the brands that weathered it were really honest with with their customers and we're like, Hey guys, this shit's happened. Uh, we don't even have a date for you yet, but we're going to work on it. And in exchange for doing that, we're going to do this. The ones that got really hammered are ones that just mismanaged communication because people can be very, very reasonable as long as you just don't bullshit them and people is in the customers. You know, Mark, I know from my research, you know, team and culture is important to you. So I love to hear about, you know, hiring and how you maintain culture. Because again, I think people are all over the world on your team. Yeah, yeah, it's super, super important. So it's like we have three values, which is smarter, faster, happier. And the idea there is that you should be able to build really big things while getting better at it, while enjoying the process. Because I'd, I'd had some tough slogs working inside of like venture back companies, which once your goals are set by like VCs, they'll want you to hit the moon or just miss and die. Like that, that that's kind of the business model. If they have one in 20, that's going to be a unicorn. They want to find out who that's going to be as quickly as possible. And it's, it's kind of just a quick decision that gets pushed down. And then in the engine room, the people dealing with that are just burning out, like just getting absolutely slammed. So I wanted to make sure that when I built Grow Shop that we we didn't do that. We didn't do that. So in terms of the hiring process, the I do a lot of the first rounds still because I can get a good sense as to someone's culture fit very quickly. And it's small things like asking about what they're reading, you know, and a lot of it is just chit chat kind of bullshit for 15 minutes just to to see how curious someone is and to see how they've thought about solving problems in their lives, like whether they've got up and traveled and moved and the problems they've had there, how they've overcome them, that that type of stuff's really important. And then we do a paid audit. So we'll give them access to some anonymized data. And if and it will vary based on the seniority of the role. But if they don't progress into a full-time role, then we'll pay them to thank them for their time, which works quite well. Uh, but then in terms of the people we look for, we look for entrepreneurial kind of people that will ultimately start their own business, which feels counterintuitive, but it's like, I've left all the companies that I've left because I got capped. So instead what we do is we hire people that we can train up and be phenomenal. And then if they want to launch something of their own, they can do it with the team that they've helped build. So they can ultimately become like a client or we can invest in. Typically, what have you seen? Do people want to start a brand or e-commerce business? You know what? A lot do, but then after they they work with a bunch, they're like, it's way too hard. I don't I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. Because with with our side of it, like a lot of people have just managed Facebook ads and they're like, yeah, I scaled the shit out of that brand. I can do it. But then because we do so much, people get visibility into what it really takes. Uh, so a lot of people have wanted to, and then they're like, no chance. Sometimes the grass is greener. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you mentioned uh, books. I'd love to hear some of your favorite favorites. Uh, what? Uh, your favorite uh, books. books. Yeah. Uh, so a few, let me, let me pull up on my Kindle. So a few that I really like is it's like a bit of a mix. I like some wacky ones. Like Bill Bryson is one of my favorite writers. Uh, because to get my head like out of thinking business, I love travel and travel stories and I like funny ones. So his, his depiction of traveling around Europe and then Australia and Africa, it's just, it's outstanding. And I'd like to be laughing and kind of joking around as it, as it really opens up my brain. But then on, on the other side of things, when I like to read businessy types of books, the Almanac by Naval, uh, Naval is unbelievable. And I like to read that or listen to that. 
like once once every six months uh and then there's there's also like wacky old ones like i like learning about things like cybernetic transposition and like goal setting and kind of setting visions and realizing that so much of that came from like years and years and years ago and then things like simplify was really good that was fantastic and then i like books about science so like the science delusion that's fantastic as it as it helps you like when you're learning about atoms and molecules uh it pulls you down to such like a deep layer uh that you see different patterns when you come back up any yeah. uh favorites so, when it relates to goal setting any authors or uh, to goal setting yeah i think uh cybernetic transposition is before is for sure one of my favorites or as a man thinketh really really good really powerful and they all, you know what, they all kind of say the same shit like when, it, when, it, when it comes down to it. But it's just, it's reaffirming that, hey, if, if there's a lot of interesting people talking about a similar thing, there's got to be something there. Yeah. I mean, you see patterns. You probably see patterns, same thing with the with the e-commerce, right? It's certain things work. You're seeing certain things work across a bunch of brands and you start to see patterns. Yeah, exactly, man. Exactly. And sometimes, sometimes the brain needs a little bit of force feeding through repetition to, to kind of get it. Yeah. I mentioned Mark, um, you had to depart from Ukraine. So yes. what was that experience like? Uh, a bit, yeah, t- a tough one, tough one. So we, we built out quite, quite a big, a big team there in Ukraine uh, who were just amazing, like some of the best people I've ever met, and then found found the love of my life, uh, and then and then the whole war thing started, uh, and it was very weird. So we, we were away in Paris for the weekend for her birthday, kind of knowing that something was going to go down, and then a few days later it all it all started. So then we were kind of actual actual refugees for six seven months. Or six you were just months stranded or so, and then, there. Yeah, stranded. And it was weird because I kind of have an arrogance having like an Australian passport. Oh, I can go anywhere. But then like the visa clocks run out and you've got to keep moving around. And it was one of the first big years after COVID travel where people are more confident. So Airbnb prices are just insane. So we're just getting slammed uh, from that point and then having to move and then trying to stay focused and building the agency where you have to get pick up and move every three, four weeks. Uh, yeah, quite a weird experience. I imagine um, your wife's family was there, even though she was traveling outside the country. Yeah, well, they they were stuck because men men can't leave if you're you're under fifty or so. So, like her dad is awesome. Uh, they were stuck there, and then it's very tough for mom to leave because she's got cats and her life there. So it's it's like a a Western perspective is like, oh, why don't why don't you just leave? Like, it's not that easy to leave. Like, where are you going to go? How are you going to take your stuff? And it's like a thirty-five hour train to get out. Uh, yeah, and people, not everyone's got employment. Not everyone speaks English or you know other languages. It's very very tough. Did you end up going back? I mean, it's almost like you just kind of leave your stuff stranded there. Yeah, we did. We waited until it calmed down a little bit, uh, and then went went back in uh, for six weeks or so. So we had to pack up the apartment and wanted to see family. Were you uh, worried yeah, was very... that you would not be able to get out once going back in? Uh, I wasn't too worried that we couldn't get out. It was just the level of difficulty to get back out. It was more. It was a bit. It was a bit worrying when we were there. So I did like a lot of nerdy analysis on the different military targets that would be close to us. We were unfortunately positioned right between the parliament and then the mayor's office. So I was like, that's kind of not good. But then I analyzed all of the different warheads that the Russians were using and then looked at the blast radius of all of the different types of ones. So I was like, all right, if they hit any of those, they're going to be like 300, 500 meters away from us. So then our windows will break. And I <laughs> looked at the rate that windows would shatter. So I was like, windows would shatter, but then we'll be we'll be safe. It's like that, but that bit was a bit nerve-wracking. It's nothing else that you want to do. I guess the analysis that you've done for e-commerce has paid off when you're trying to go into a war zone. You never thought you'd use it like <laughs> that before. 
Yeah, I bu- I did. Yeah, I built a dashboard. Uh, yeah, I had, I had to know that, but it, it gave enough confidence. So, Mark, it's hard. I mean, most under normal conditions, it's not necessarily easy to run a business. How are you running the business during these type of conditions where you're traveling, you're kind of pushed out of your home and everything uh, that was going on? It is, it is really hard because the, the weird bit is that you still you still have the same hours in the day. So from, from that perspective, it's still there. But then not having like a – and just before it left, Nostra had built me like the best office ever. So I had my whiteboard. I had the desk. I had the monitors. And it's like it's unbelievable. And like the amount you can get done when you have the right environment is just – it's mind-blowing. So then to have that and you're on like a tiny table and you're just off the laptop and then the Wi-Fi is dropping out and then you've shifted time zones again and then you've got to work out where all the local things are. It was really weird. So the, And you feel, you feel like a bit of a failure because you know what you're capable of, but it's kind of like you got this incline uphill like that with weight strap. And then in the beginning, we, we didn't even know if the family was safe and dad was in a really hard situation. So trying to support from that side while trying to build things. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. What do you do mentally during those times? Because like you said, it, it's not just the business. Now you're worried about everything else that's going on that puts things in perspective too. Yeah, I think it's it's trying to like reduce things down to the minimum. So I'd, I'd shift my typical like goal setting to just be – what are the what are the three things that I need to do today that are just going to keep the business going? Just those three things, and then I use like Pomodoro timers, super helpful. So that that's and I I always use that. But here it was just essential because like if I do four twenty five minute blocks in a day on the three most important things, it's often enough to just keep things rolling. So it's it's trying to get hyper hyper focused. Love it. I have one last question, Mark. First, before I ask it, thank you. Thanks for sharing the journey. It's pretty remarkable what you've done. Um, and I want to point people to growth.shop and learn more. Learn more about what Mark and the team are doing. Uh, check out more episodes of the podcast as well. Um, you know, what's next, Mark, for, for Growth Shop? It's, it's, all about, it's all about the data. It's all about the numbers. So the focus of this year is well it's twofold so it's it's extending out our, our platform so that people can get access to it even if they're not uh, a managed service client so super excited for that and then the next bit is on the grocery shop academy so it's it's taking all the pieces that we've learned uh, that the companies even if they're not at a level where it would economically make sense to be managed service we still want to give people access to all of that information uh, so that they can grow and get to the level where they'd be ready to jump in so those two pieces are going to keep us pretty busy. So people could do Growth Shop Academy. They could have access to the platform if they want to use it or the uh, the managed services where you basically take care of everything for them. Bingo. Are there any yeah, other places nice. online we should point people to or is growth.shop the best place? That's a good spot. Or you can just find me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to talk shop. Is the platform piece... Can people find that through the same site? Not yet. Not yet. That's that's still behind the scenes for, for the managed service people. Yeah. So at it's some coming. point, it will show up magically on the site when it's ready for external will, people. A little spark, I think. Yeah, Got exactly, it. man. Cool. Everyone go check out growth.shop. And Mark, thank you so much. Right on. Pleasure, man. Like a beach if you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand